Um, I live in Silicon Valley in San Mateo, but I'm mostly on an airplane. Um, traveling around the world, getting to do cool things like talk about Spring, uh, which I love. And uh, also writing a book called Cloud Native Java to the Labor of Love over the last two years with Josh Long, who's also a Spring developer advocate. Um, and this book's all about building microservices as cloud native applications using Spring Boot, uh, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. Oh, I also like to say that I, I build highly scalable Hello World app. That's going to be a theme. So, all right, so a little bit of an agenda. We're going to talk about monolith to microservices, so tracing the progression, answering the question of why. Uh, why are we on this path? Um, and then I'm going to show you an online store example that I put together for the book. I'm going to walk through a demo of it. Usually I have people guess how many microservices. If you want to just shout out a number, um, I welcome you to do that. And um, then I'll talk about Spring Boot a little bit. Who's using Spring today? Just curious. That's a lot of people. Uh, and then I'll talk about event-driven microservices, some of the work that I've done, research that I've done, some of the things that I've seen uh, with Pivotal's customers, and I'll show you some patterns that are successful. OK, microservices, how did we get there? So we started with the monolithic application architecture. right? This is something that we should all be familiar with. Um, now, in this deployment, we have one war artifact, and we have modules in there. I have a storefront UI. I have an accounting service, an inventory service, and a shipping service. So we have modularity in this deployment. But the problem, as you may know, is that when you have one deployment, when you're sharing one deployment pipeline, and everybody's working off that deployment pipeline, things are going to slow down. right? You're going to have conflicts. You're going to need to coordinate more. And so this introduces a bunch of problems into this kind of architecture. So first of all, it's going to slow our velocity getting to production. right? So if we have a bunch of different teams who are competing to add features in the product, that's really going to slow things down. And also, it takes too long to ramp up engineers. So it's not so simple just to add more engineers to a project to go faster. Right? So if we have a million lines of code, a code base that has a million lines, then these developers are going to have to spend time ramping up on that code before they're able to effectively um, commit changes in, in, and not uh, commit defects into production. So at some point, the code base becomes too large for any one person to fully comprehend. Right. And the most productive engineers become historians. They become the storytellers, the oracles that you go to, not the database, but the people, the people that you go to in the organization to learn the history of the code base. And they're the most productive engineers, usually. Um, they started the application. They have uh, all of the context necessary to understand how to implement new features. And they're stuck telling this story. Also, there are two opposing forces in this kind of development on a monolithic application, right? So you have one force, which is the developers, who are responsible for making changes. And then you have other forces that are opposing those changes, right? So there's these flood of changes that are getting into production. And then you have DBAs. You have your ops team who are resisting these changes. They're fighting back uh, because they have other responsibilities that are pretty important, like keeping production online, um, making sure the database stays online. And so we have this kind of this uh, push and pull between these two teams that causes a lot of strife. And we also have to coordinate a lot more, right? So our release cycles are going to get bigger uh, because we have to coordinate more between our product managers, between our teams. And this kind of creates this culture of negotiating, bartering on which features get into the next release. And then our operations team is responsible for all of the infrastructure, right? They're responsible for the runtime environment of the applications. And so we have our developers who may want to use a new tool or a new version of a tool, and they're going to have to go through, submit a ticket to operations to get a virtual machine upgraded, right? So our ops team is going to be responsible for all of our infrastructure, not just making sure that the application stays online and monitoring it, but also responsible for upgrading these virtual machines. And that's a lot of responsibility. But more than anything, it's this, right? You have to deploy everything at once or nothing at all. And that creates a lot of cultural problems, which slow things down and create a lot of friction. So then we move to this. We move towards the service-oriented architecture, the SOA. Um, and here I have an example um, of a services team who's managing three different services, the accounting service, inventory, and shipping. And now we've gotten a little bit better, right? We split out that one deployment pipeline into three different deployment pipelines. And there may be more, 
But the problem here is that um, it's not so easy just to deploy one service if I have one change. Now, if you look at the very bottom there in green, we kind of have these, these domain objects that we're using as a language to implement features in the application. So if I just make a change to, let's say, customers or accounts, then I can just deploy the accounting service. No big deal, no problem. But what happens if I make a change to the address record? Then I have a coordinated release of three separate artifacts, right? And what happens if something goes wrong? Now I need to roll everything back at the same time as well. And so this creates a lot of complexity, um, which isn't very efficient for making sure that production um, doesn't go down. So now we've arrived at microservices, right? And we've gotten better at a lot of things. We've also kind of got a little bit worse at some things. Um, but in general, it solves a lot of these problems that we had with a monolithic application architecture. So first of all, small teams are going to organize around business capabilities. Um, I'm sure most of you, if you've attended the previous track today, have heard this story over and over again. Um, and then we're going to have each microservice team expose an API over REST, over HTTP, and they're going to integrate with other services. So we're going to have this producer and consumer economy of APIs which are going to be used to implement features. Now, the beauty of this, so well, theoretically, is that each team can go at their own pace. They can independently deploy their changes to production, and they don't have to worry about all these other teams competing with them to introduce features into one large monolithic application. So each microservice is independently deployable, right? Well, each microservice is independently deployable, which is going to increase the speed that we can get changes into a production environment. But each microservice has to be careful about the changes that are the libraries that they're going to share, right? So if there's a library that's shared across these microservices, and I make a change, and I have a coordinated release, then we're stuck into the same problem. But at 100 microservices or more, that's going to be very hard to manage. So teams can pick the best tool for the job. That's one of the benefits. So you see a lot of yellow here. In this example application, I have a, a movie application kind of like Netflix. I have the user service, the movie service, rating, recommendation, and analysis. Now, each one of these applications is a small team of developers, and each one is able to choose the tools that are best suited to solve the problem at hand. For example, the rating service is responsible for generating recommendations. They're going to connect a user object to, to a movie object um, using a rating, and they're going to generate a recommendation. Now, what they're doing to do that is that they're going to use Apache Spark. They're going to use GraphX to create a page rank, page rank recommendation off of that data. Now, that data doesn't really fit well into a relational database, and so they decided to use Neo4j instead, which is a graph database. And so one of the benefits with this architecture is you can choose these tools that are more efficient at solving some problems um, that you would uh, otherwise have to use a relational database and then transform that data into a graph, which adds a lot more complexity. But things also become harder, right? So if we have a transaction that spans multiple services, how are we going to manage rolling back maybe an inconsistent state that spans three different services? So if I have a rating service, a transaction that spans the rating service, user service, and movie service, and something goes wrong with the user service, now I've changed state in three different databases, all with their own different guarantees, and I have no reliable way to roll back that change, right? And so that's why we use things like event sourcing, because we have a audit trail of all of the events that have happened that have changed the state of the system and can use that to roll back. So now I'm going to walk you through an online store example that I put together. I'll have you guys shout out a number of how many microservices you think are behind this application. So this is Cloud Native Outfitters. Not quite. Let's try something else. So this is Cloud Native Outfitters. Uh, it's an online store application they put together, and it sells just for t-shirts. Um, now, this is built with microservices, and this is just the front-end application. The, it's a single-page application just with static content, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I can go ahead and explore the product catalog here. So I can go to one of the shirts. That's not cool. That's embarrassing. Somebody got access to my AWS account. I shouldn't show that in my demos, my keys. All right, so I'm going to pretend like it's a real application. All right, so here's the online store application. And what I can do is I can 
um, add products to my cart, and I can check out. Uh, but before I do that, I need to sign in. I'm redirected to an OAuth2 gateway, and so I'll be redirected back to the application. So there's at least two apps here. And what I can do is just a basic workflow of adding products to the cart and then checking out and creating an order. Now, if you want to think in terms of a front-end developer, how hard would it be to communicate with 500 different microservices in a back-end to develop out an application? Now, for our front-end developers, they want to be able to develop the app just in, in the same way that they have with a monolithic application. And so we can use something called an API gateway to do that. So I'll have you guys guess. I know it's not as exciting as showing you the demo. I'm um, sorry about that. But how many microservices do you think, more than two, are powering this application? I heard five. I heard eight. Ten, yes, in the back. <laughs> There's ten microservices here. Now, at the very top, we interacted, well, very briefly, with the online store web. And that's hosting our static content. Um, and in the middle there, we actually would have interacted with another service called the user service, which is the OAuth2 gateway. Now, in this process of being redirected back to the online store web, um, I'm able to use these services in the middle uh, to reuse these services across all my microservice applications. But in order to develop against a lot of microservices, what I can use is an API gateway. Now, there in the center, I have the edge service in red, which is going to act as my API gateway. Uh, which I can use to reverse proxy into backend services. Now, at the very bottom, those are my microservices. I have a catalog service, an account service, inventory, shopping cart, and order. Now, each one of these microservices has their own database. Um, it's a small team of developers who are implementing features and deploying independently. Uh, but that API gateway in the center is going to allow front end developers to seam seamlessly integrate with these backend services. So they can just reverse proxy to forward slash account, and that gives them access to the account service, or forward slash cart, and that'll give them access to the shopping cart service. Now I have some other things here. I have a discovery service and a configuration server. Um, that are, those things are gonna give me the ability to be able to centralize my configuration management, as well as being able to discover other services. Now, in the process of uh, using microservices or going to microservices, it's not so simple just to build new applications. Um, and so companies are wondering who, who have solutions or software that are 10 years or more old, uh, how do I go from my monolithic application to a microservice? And so this is one method, which is called splitting the, mic uh, splitting the monolith, where I can go into my monolithic application, and module by module, I can extract them out, refactor them into separate applications, um, and then I can communicate back over HTTP. Now, the first step in this process is to, uh, in this example, I have a customer service there, which used to have a front, front end inside of it. So the first step is I'm just gonna rip out that front end, and I'm gonna create that as the online banking application there. And then I'm gonna communicate over HTTP back to the customer service. Now, I have a discovery service and a configuration service here as well, which are going to help me, as I add more microservices, be able to discover, discover other services and manage my configuration. Now, in the back end, that's going to be the first place I take a look at uh, when I decide what's a good next service to extract out. Now, I have a user table here, which looks good. Of course, there's no foreign key relationships or anything connecting it to the other tables in the database, which makes it great. Um, and what I've done here is I've migrated that to a new database called the user DB. And I've also refactored the customer service, um, all of the code related to authentication for users, to a new service called the user service. Now, this looks very simple, right? So on paper, this looks good. But in practice, how well does this work? Has anyone tried this? Is anyone skeptical? I'm a little skeptical. Right, because you have all this other stuff there in the back end that you're not really paying attention to, right? Like a data warehouse, right? Or foreign key relationships. It's not so easy just to rip things out and create new applications. Now, people do this and they're successful with it, but it does introduce a lot of problems. Uh, with old applications, legacy applications, you have an ecosystem of communication between software that it doesn't make it so easy just to rip things out and create it as a new microservice. So there are problems with microservices as well. Uh, the first one is, is that there's no foreign key constraints between services, right? So if I have three different microservices and they're referencing objects to one another that are stored in their database, if I delete one, then I don't really have a foreign key constraint in the other services uh, to delete those objects as well. 
going to switch my view real quick. So splitting up my large database with years and years of history isn't so easy. And it's not going to be done without interrupting the business as well. Another microservice problem is I have, I have legacy problems. I've got layers and layers of legacy scarring that runs from my ESP all the way down to my mainframe. And I have to worry about how I add another layer of microservices all around this, right? So I can use something called the Strangler pattern, which over time you'll run a new workload side by side with, with an older workload. And you can begin to deprecate or begin to phase out that legacy technology over time. Another problem is what about my data warehouse, right? So not only do real companies with real software have complex database schemas, but they also um, have ETLs running back and forth between a production database and data warehouse, right? So I have to worry about that as well. Now, getting everybody on the same page at a large company is pretty difficult, right? So you have to get everyone together to agree on what's affected by taking a, a module and a monolithic application and refactoring it out as a microservice. Also, teams are gonna be creating redundant functionality, right? So I've solved all my legacy problems, and I'm on track to success. My teams are pumping out features very fast, so I get that, hooray. But wait, there's more code, lots more code. And you have a lot of teams that are creating redundant code like an authentication provider. Um, let's say we have 15 different teams creating the same functionality, and now we have Snowflake implementations all across our microservices, but nobody really knows what's being created um, the same in each one of these services. Also, distributed transactions are brittle, right? So I've solved all my re redundancy problems. I'm extracting out redundant code. I'm creating it as a service and providing it through a cloud platform. Uh, but now I have a distributed transaction problem. So my teams are creating transactions that are spanning these multiple services, and because they're using brittle HTTP, my data gets into an unrecoverable, uh, inconsistent state. So now customer support is asking DBAs to change fields in the database, but all the DBAs left. Um, and so now I have a mess on my hand. So microservices introduce a bunch more uh, problems. And I like this quote, so every bug becomes a murder mystery, right? So I've somehow managed to refactor my 500 microservices to use event sourcing, to use CQRS, to, hand, to handle distributed transactions. Um, and that only took 10 years, and now everything's serverless and AI and chatbots. Um, but now I can't see what's going on with my application, right? So I have all of these different microservices, and I have no way to observe what's going on when something goes wrong. So I have to go to each one of these teams to figure out what's going, uh, what's going wrong. So I ask questions, and eventually I might be able to trace uh, the root cause. So distributed systems are very hard, right? Um, no one said it was going to be easy, but we need these other things, these other tooling, uh, to be able to help us solve these problems. So without event-driven architectures and a cloud platform, uh, you're going to quickly drown from all the hard problems that you might have not known um, existed. So a lot of people are using Spring Boot today. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through it. What is Spring Boot? I like to um, call on Phil Webb's tweet. This is about last year uh, when he wanted to explain the difference between Spring Framework and Spring Boot. And the way that he explained it is that the Spring ecosystem is really a collection of projects, which are like ingredients that I can compose together manually to bake a finished service or a cake. Now, the eggs here might be Spring MVC, and the flour might be Spring Security. Now, I can have to configure each one of these components manually and put them together for my finished application. Now, Spring Boot really is just a way to auto-configure, to uh, ask uh, Spring Initializer uh, for a set of ingredients, and you get the finished cake. So since my first demo failed, I'm going to try it another one. And so I'm going to show you Spring Initializer. So Spring Initializer at start.spring.io is going to allow you to choose a set of ingredients that you need to build your microservice. And so I'm going to quickly walk through this. Uh, here I can generate a Maven project or a Gradle project. I can choose my Spring Boot version. And then I can name my service. I'll name this the user service. And then I can choose my dependencies. 
So here I'm going to choose web. I'm going to choose JPA. That's going to allow me to create my data objects, uh, to use ORM to map them to a relational database. So I'll choose JPA. Then I'm going to choose H2. Uh, that's an in-memory database. I can, of course, choose my SQL, but I'll choose H2. And then I'm going to need a REST API, so I'm going to choose REST repositories. That's going to turn my data layer, all my domain objects, into a REST API. And the last thing I'll choose here is Actuator. Now, Actuator is a special project. I can add onto my application, and it's going to expose a set of endpoints uh, over HTTP, which allow me to introspect my application. So I'll choose Actuator. Then finally, I'm going to generate my project. And it uh, downloads a compressed folder with my source code. And I'm just going to go ahead and run it. So I'm going to use the command here, maven spring boot run. And that's going to compile my application and start it up. So the application is going to start up on port 8080. And if I open it up in a browser, feeling lucky. All right, so I've got a localhost 8080 in my browser, and I get back a response here in JSON. It's the hypermedia response, which tells me what I can do with my application. Now, one of the things I can do out of the box here is go to forward slash actuator. And I'm going to get back a set of links here that I can use to introspect my application. Um, I can look at, for instance, health, which tells me the status of my application, or info, which tells me very little right now. And if I go to ENV, I get an error, which is expected, because Spring Boot's going to auto-configure everything out of the box, right? So the Spring engineers have an opinion of how these components should be configured. Now, if I go to back to the source code here, I'm going to open this up in IntelliJ IDEA. Anytime now. All right, so in the project here, I have a configuration file. If I go to source main resources, I have an application properties file. Now, in this application properties file, I can override all of the default configuration, which is the opinion of the Spring engineers. And one of those opinions is that they should secure the actuator endpoints so nobody can actually look at the environment variables. But if you go to start.spring.io and you go to forward slash env, It's not secured. But in the application, it is. Now, if I go back to the console output, it says here that I should enable security. So there is a key here, which is management.security.enable, which I can add to my application properties, and I can disable it. I can also do things like change the port of the application. I'll change it to 7272. Now I can restart that application. And we can see that it started on port 7272. So if I go back to my browser, I can see here that I can access the environment endpoint. Uh, now, just to walk through this, I can see information about the port that I'm running on. I can see information about the system properties. If I scroll down, I can also see information about the system environment. 
Now, in a microservice architecture, this becomes very useful, right? You're going to have all of these different applications, um, and you're going to want a way to introspect the environment um, remotely. And so this gives you a way to do that over HTTP. Now, this is probably what I did wrong with that first demo, is I put my AWS secret key in all of my demos. Not a good idea. I don't advise it. And at the very bottom, very important, is our application config. Now, in this block, you're going to see all of the overridden configuration um, that you have applied to the application. So we can see here the server port, and can see here that I've disabled the security. Now, in 12-factor applications, you're going to want to separate out the configuration from your build and put it in the remote environment. And Spring Boot conforms to this. And so here we can see that it's coming from the class path of the application at application properties. Um, but I can also retrieve that remotely from a configuration server, which is going to host that file for me. So now the good stuff, the event-driven microservices. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some of the patterns that I've uh, used for event-driven microservices. Now, earlier I said that I build highly scalable Hello World applications for a living. Um, I have about five reference projects of um, microservices, and one of them is event-driven microservices. Um, now, I worked with Chris Richardson a bit, who is probably the foremost expert on event-driven microservices. He has a website called microservices.io. And I learned a lot from him about what he's done with CQRS and event sourcing, and I've, I've applied it to our Spring Boot projects and created microservices. So the first thing is that you want to treat events as first-class citizens, right? So you're going to use practices like event storming, uh, which is a way to use domain-driven design to come up with a design for your data in your application, which you can use to uh, separate out your applications, your microservices, uh, in, in a modular way. The second thing is that domain events have a subject and contain immutable data. So any data that's stored in a domain event is forever immutable and shouldn't be changed. To change anything, to change state, then you're going to append events uh, which mean that some events can be used to reverse the state. If you got into an inconsistent state, you can append an event and use that to roll back. Also, every domain event applies a state transition to an aggregate, right? So we, if we have a domain object, which is an aggregate, it's going to have a status field on it. Now, every single event that's applied to that aggregate is going to change the state. And that's very important, because we're going to be able to use that to ensure that multiple events aren't processed on the same object, right? So if I have two or three events come in, the first event's going to be applied, it's going to change the state, and then we can't change that state again with other events. Also, domain events can only be applied if the aggregate is in a valid state. So if the current state of an aggregate is invalid for an event that is being handled, we're just going to reject the event, and we're not going to add it to the event log. So an example of this here, here I have uh, a directed graph, which is a state machine. And if you know what your state is, then you know whether or not an incoming event is valid. Right? So in this process, I have order created, account connected, reservation pending, and reservation added. Now, as the events are processed, we're going to transition our state um, to each one of these statuses. Right? So going from order created, we have an order created event which sits at the edge. And we know which state we can transition to. So if I receive an order created event, but I'm in a reservation pending status, we know that I can't advance, right? Also, create meaningful exceptions uh, if a domain event can't be applied. So every event handler has the opportunity to raise a meaningful exception about why an event can't be applied. So since you know where you're at in that state machine, you can say things like, this account has already been confirmed. Or you can say, an active account can't create an order. Right? And so this gives you a way to create these exceptions in a natural way uh, so your developer can understand what's going on uh, when something goes wrong. Also, event sourcing stores every state transition as an event in a log. So every event that's been applied to an aggregate is appended to a log. And the log is used to recreate the state of the aggregate and models the behavior of an aggregate over time. Now, we can consume this event log in the same way we use version control on our source code. 
So here I have an example, which is uh, an event log here, and we see that the order of events are order created, account connected, and reservation pending. Now each one of these events is going to have a timestamp. Now making this event log accessible is pretty important. So what you can do is you can uh, build a hypermedia API and you can attach the event log as a link on a resource. And so if I'm consuming an API, maybe it's an account API, I can see the event log that's uh, connected to an individual account. Also commands are going to generate events. So one or more events. So if I have an, a, a command like create account, um, I might have multiple events that are fired off and handled by different services. So you can also attach commands to aggregates, just like I attach the event log. And each command is an action, and it's implemented inside an aggregates class, and it's going to invoke a seri series of events, and you can make these commands accessible again via an API. So here's an example of a order object which has a series of commands attached to it, uh, something like connect account, connect payment, and create payment. So these event handlers can subscribe to an event and apply state changes to an aggregate. Um, and this is going to allow you to be able to process events from other services. For example, if I have one microservice for an account uh, that can trigger an event to create a new order, that order will be created by an event handler that sits on the order service. Also, the event log is used to generate the current state of an aggregate. So in an example here, I have a full state machine, uh, and this is for an order, and you can see the transitions between each box, um, and I can use the state machine as a guide to understand how to recover from inconsistent states. So at the very top, I have order created, and that's going to transition to account connected, and then reservation pending, and then reservation added, but then I have a fork. I can go between uh, reservation succeeded or failed. Now in the case that something failed, we see that uh, down there I have reservation failed, event, and the state, and we can see a final state here, which is order failed. Now, if things get inconsistent, I can always use this event log to figure out where I need to go, right? It's kind of like a map. So event handlers are nodes on a directed graph. So here you see that state machine modeled again. So each one of these boxes uh, represents the current state, but can also be an event handler. And the events themselves are just relationships between these states, between these event handlers. Like, for example, reservation failed. Now we can add CQRS onto this to create materialized views from a stream of events. So in this model here, um, I have a command query model. And on the left side, I have suspend account. Now I'm going to create an API that allows uh, my consumers to trigger commands, like suspend account. And that's going to write to my database. So I'll update the status of an account as suspended, and then I'll be able to query that from the account model, uh, which is on the query side. So I have these two sides. I have a command side and a query side. Now creating this as microservices, one of the things you might do is to separate out the command side from the query side as separate applications. And so here I have an example of a Spring Boot application, uh, which is my command service, and that's going to expose an API with a set of commands that I can apply to an aggregate. Now the result of that is that I'm going to add events to the event store here, which is Apache Kafka, and that's going to serve as my transaction log, my event log for each aggregate. Then I can have an event processor, which is another separate application, and that's going to pick up events, and it's going to be, uh, those events will be used to create a connected model of data that's stored on different services. So let's say I wanted to create a reporting database that connects together all of the data stored in all the different microservices, um, then I can use the event processor here to output a materialized view into a data store, which will then be read on the query side. And then I might want to add an API gateway on top of that. So at the very top here, we have a front-end application, uh, similar to the architecture I showed you earlier. And that's going to make sure that uh, these uh, separate applications are all uh, connected together as a seamless API.
Now I can also add event handlers as serverless functions. Now AWS has a service called Step Functions, uh, which does this. But it's also possible to uh, create a Spring Boot application, which is your microservice, uh, which serves as an event source. And so then you can feed events into a serverless application, um, and you can begin to create these serverless event handlers around your microservice, um, which allows you to do interesting things like change state. So finally, uh, again, I build highly scalable Hello World applications. Apparently, they don't work very well. But um, so I've done a lot of research into this, and I have a bunch of open source projects and blog posts um, that you can uh, look at in my blog. And, but the advice I give you is just to do what makes sense. But don't build microservices without events, right? If you have to think about refactoring later all of your microservices to start using events, it's going to be very hard. And that's all I have. Since we're in Chicago, I should announce uh, we have spring days uh, coming up. So if you're interested in that, I can talk more about that later. And provide feedback using the GoTo app. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. So we do have some time for some questions. So do we have any questions out there in the audience? How, how do you load balance the microservice? Is it any different from load balancing other services? So there's two ways to load balance, right? You can server-side load balance or you can client-side. Now, with Spring Cloud, we provide functionality for you to do that uh, from the client side. So back in 2008, Netflix created kind of a cloud-native platform, and they built in client-side load balancing. Uh, so with a discovery service, I can keep track of these instances and where they're located. And then in my client application, I can just load balance, switch between these separate instances. Actually, uh, just follow up on that um, discovery service. So I assume you're talking about Eureka. Yes. Correct? So if uh, a company is starting new with microservices, um, and going to cloud. Would you still recommend Eureka versus Kubernetes? Um, well, I would recommend, if you're using a cloud platform, if you're using a PaaS, if you have to implement the same thing in every service, for instance, client-side load balancing, you should instead provide that as a service to your platform. And so I recommend using server-side load balancing. But it's also possible to container-to-container -container networking. Um, actually, let me go back to diagram here. So in this diagram here, that online store, um, what you can do is in the middle there, that can all be server-side load balancing. Now they're going to have routes uh, that you can bind to uh, with your platform, but at the very bottom, those can all be container-to-container -container networking. Those can just use uh, something like Eureka for service discovery. We had a question on the, uh, on the Magic app. Was I wondering if, if there was a link to your, the rep repositories you were mentioning or the presentations? that you can put up on the screen yeah. so people can find all of your reference architectures. So you can find them at uh, kennybastani.com. And I have tutorials and open source projects for each. Well, not very helpful. There we go. Um, so each one of these blog posts will walk you through the reference architecture. Um, I have a few of them here for event-driven microservices. Um, and each one contains a link to uh, the open source project. Time for one more question, maybe? OK, well, uh, if you, you can join with me in thanking Kenny very much for his talk. Um, Thank you, guys.